Hello, welcome back. Uh, start of unit three, uh, chapters six and seven. This should run us up to Christmas or thereabouts. Um, looking at the glossary, uh, you're saying, well, there's, there's more terms here than last time. But what I'm gonna say is you see a lot of words with kind of the same, excuse me, a lot of glossary terms with the same root word in them. Uh, so what I'm gonna say is feel free to bunch these together. So we have here a bunch of stuff about binomials. I'd say it'd be fair to put those together on one note card, maybe two. Uh, I think splitting along maybe a binary, binomial setting might be a great place to split. Um, you have continuous and discrete random variables. Those are two very uh, related things. You might have those on two cards or one card. I mean, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, factorial, that's probably one thing. Uh, but then you notice you got geometric distribution. And OK, so I'll do geometric. And you're going to have a bunch more geometric distribution stuff um, through here. And I could say that that could all be on one card, maybe, maybe two, if you put the geometric setting on a different thing. Great. Uh, and then what else do we have? We have uh, some individual things, independent random variables. Uh, that's a big thing. Uh, linear transformations. I'm going to put a star by that. That's a very big thing. Uh, we have here our means uh, of a random variable here, mean of expel. Okay, those are great. Uh, one last thing you might put together. Um, a lot of these means might end up getting put together, but any of these things that uh, say geometric, you put, might put uh, the geometric back with all the other geometric stuff. You might put the binomial back with all the binomial stuff. My point here is that a lot of these can be combined. So uh, if you see the same kind of roots in different glossary terms, and you say, man, I don't want to make 40 different because like three of these seem to be talking about the same thing. Put them on the same card. Just maybe make it a bigger card. I don't care. Uh, let's get into the notes. Uh, we are talking about discrete and continuous random variables. What motivated this? Who said, well, I want to know what the average... Uh, average this is going to be if I do this thing over and over, or what the expected return on that thing is going to be if I do it over and over. I'll, I'll be frank, uh, random variables, this study, this this came out of somebody trying to beat the casino. This came out of uh, one, of, one of the Pascals. There were a bunch of them. You've heard of Pascal and the gas laws. It's a, it's a, it's a relative of his here in, uh, in random variables. Uh, saying how do I beat the casino or how do I design a casino game such that I know I'm going to make money on it how do I how do I design uh, an event such that well they're going to pay me and I'm going to pay them back but not as often as they're going to pay me well that, gambling uh, is where this starts uh, we've got some refreshers on uh, vocabulary terms from uh, old units with difference between discrete and continuous data uh, you will hopefully remember that discrete takes uh, specific values uh, whereas what does continuous do? Continuous takes any value on an interval. Uh, why is that important? Well, the type of variable is going to dictate the type of tools we use. Um, discrete random variables. Uh, how many times you know, do I win or you know, this outcome or that come on a casino table? Uh, versus continuous outcomes might be something that results from like a normal distribution or something, right? The normal distribution isn't gone. We're going to keep using it. If you kind of BS your way through that last test, and you, you probably didn't go that well if you BS your way through the uh, normal stuff. But if you're still not real, real confident on that, we need to go back and shore that uh, stuff up. Uh, what are some examples of discrete random variables? Well, uh, you know, the amount of money could be the money one on the roulette table or on a roulette bet, single roulette bet, that's a discrete random variable. You put $10 down, you're gonna get some multiple of $10 back, right? Depending on what the what the odds the bet were, right? Um, so discrete random variables, money one on a roulette bet, you know, like the number, number of car crashes on uh, I-29, you know, things that happen in whole numbers or in specific values. And then the last thing uh, I need to mention before we dive into some uh, new vocabulary here is uh, some algebra notations. So that algebra notation being at least and at most. So if I said x is at least 
six. Well, you could write that x greater than equals six. If this was a discrete case, we'd be talking about six, seven, eight, dot, dot, dot. Uh, specifically, this discrete whole number case. Uh, whereas if it was like x is at most four, well, x less than equal four. If we're just talking the discrete whole number case, that would be maybe zero, one, two, three, and four. So it's going to be helpful sometimes when we're using this. What what can be? You you, you look at this and you say, oh duh, oh duh, that's obvious. I'm going to tell you right now. Put a star by this. This is where people make silly mistakes. Silly mistakes on the inequality mean that you set up to like solve the wrong thing and you do all this great work, but you found the probability that X was greater than six, not at least six. And so you didn't include the six opportunity and you missed some points. All right, so what do we got here? We've got here a, a probability distribution. We've seen these before. A few rules about probability distributions you might remember is that all the individual probabilities are between zero and one. And the sum of those probabilities is one. So some things you might remember from the last unit, uh, specifically like that uh, pinata problem. If you have like three numbers in the pinata problem and they add up to, I don't know, a uh, random thing, 3.4. Uh, if they happen to add up to 3.4, you might look and say, so there's a 340% chance of something happening? All the outcomes add up to 340%? Hmm. Mm, you did something wrong. Uh, so you need two things for this discrete random variable, specifically its probability distribution. You need the values it takes and the probabilities it takes those values. And what are we going to do? Sometimes if we've got that, maybe it's you know, amounts of money I win. Maybe it's the number of car crashes on I-29. Maybe it's the number of patients seen over at uh, Weber Orthodontics, which I can see out my window on a given morning. I don't know. But there are values of number of patients, numbers of car crashes, numbers of money, one, whatever, and the probabilities associated with them. Um, how do we find those probabilities? Maybe we see them empirically. We look. Um, maybe we uh, calculate them theoretically. Right. So how do we find the mean of a discrete random variable? To find the mean, multiply each possible value by its probability. What this essentially creates for you, if you're not familiar, this is going to be a weighted average. We're going to multiply each value times each probability. Add them all up. So interpretation of the mean. This is the expected value of the random variable in context after many, many repetitions, after a, a long term, after a uh, a long time. Remember that these uh, means we we talked about you know expected values, probabilities in the last unit. We saw old John Edmund Carrich spinning his coin in his uh, Nazi internment camp, trying to see oh is does the probability really approach 0.5? Okay, what is the long term expected value? Uh, question, does the expected value of a random variable have to equal one of the possible values? And I'm going to say to you, no. Uh, my favorite example would be the number of children in uh, U.S. households. The average is something like 2.2. You can't go to a house and find 2.2 children in it. There's no house that has 2.2 children in it. Cue, you know, joke about somebody with, you know, parts of people in it but no you don't you gotta you gotta have a whole number of people in a house so no house has the average so the average uh, doesn't have to be a value that the random variable actually takes and that messes with some people that's kind of a that's a bigger conceptual point uh than you might think does the expected value have to equal one of the possible values and the answer in my watermelon coloring here is no great um so what can we do we can we can do a very simple uh roulette uh game here you can you can play something called a corner bet uh let me let me pause for a second all right we're learning about gambling now you can you can play something called a corner bet right uh i don't i don't 
I don't go to the casino. I don't do these things, but I like casino. I like thinking about them. Uh, you could place your money like right here. And then if it lands on the two, five, three or six, after you spin the wheel, you get, you get some money, right? Uh, how does it pay out? Uh, and this one, it pays out eight to one. So you put a dollar right here and it hits on one of those uh, four, you get $8 back. Uh, do you have a one, you might then ask yourself a question. Well, do I have a one eighth chance of winning? Uh, how many total numbers are there? There's 36 divided by four, nine. Ooh, it's like they've set up the payouts for this game. So they know even if I win in the long term, they're, they're making the money. Eh, casinos don't get to build those big shiny buildings because they're giving money away every day. I don't know if you were confused about that. Let's switch over to the notes. All right, so resuming the recording here, you got your corner bet, uh, you got your values that your variable can take, and you've got your probabilities. Okay, and the first thing we need to do in these sorts of situations is define what our variable is. It does it up there in the text. I'm going to do it again. X is the net gain from a uh, $1 corner bet. And if we wanted to find the mean of x, sometimes written as the expect, expected value or the expectation of x. Uh, what do we need to do? We need to add up the values times their probabilities. Uh, so for this problem, what are the values? The values are here, the probabilities are here. So that's gonna be, we're gonna lose a dollar 34 out of 38 times. I'm gonna lose a dollar 34 out of 38 times. And we're going to win eight dollars four out of 38 times. Again, what is this thing? This thing is a weighted average, folks. Just like you got when you're in my class, you know, 10% is this, 20% is that, 70% is this thing. This is a weighted average right here. But instead of percentages, you see it as fractions. But you could convert fractions to percents, you know, one to one between those two. Uh, you do the math there. Uh, what are you going to get? You're going to get uh, negative 34 over 38 uh, plus uh, 32 out of 38 gives us negative 2 over 38. And that's not a fraction that anybody particularly likes dealing with. Uh, so you go over, get your calculator, negative 2 divided by 38, hit enter, and what do you get? You get, we're going to lose five cents equals negative dollar sign 0 0.05. I'm gonna round it a little bit. What does that mean? That's the expected value or the mean of X, but, but what does that mean? That means that on average, the player loses five cents per bet. Does does he lose five cents on any individual bet? No. No, he either, he either loses a buck or he wins eight. But if you sit there and you spin that wheel forever, you know, the average is going to approach losing five cents per bet. And that's the big story about the, how the casinos make money. In the, for a couple people are going to win. They're going to be excited about it. And they're going to tell you about, oh, I had the greatest time. You know what they don't tell you about? The losses, because those aren't memorable, right? And that's not exciting. Um, so how, that this is how you get all that neon and uh, our, our excellent tax base here in, in uh, the Park Hill School District. Uh, Long-term expectations on casino bets. On average, the player loses five cents per bet, recognizing that there's no bet where he actually loses five cents. That's the average of accumulation of outcomes. So we can talk about averages of uh, discrete random variables. We can al also talk about the variance uh, and then the standard deviation. The variance is like, what is this? W well, the value minus the mean squared times the probabilities. Uh, this here is our formula for sigma, uh, sigma squared. So if we want sigma x, the standard deviation of uh, the variable, is going to be square root sum. Look at what this is. The value minus the mean. We square that distance from the mean. So that's some sort of Euclidean distance about how far away are these two things. And then multiply times how far or how often it's that far away. The probability that it is that far from the mean. 
So it's something like a like a weighted distance. It's like an average distance away. Uh, again, we see this standard deviation is going to be uh, on average the random variable takes a value sigma away from the mean mu. There's an extra n in that mean, and I apologize. Uh, so therefore, the standard deviation would be the square uh, root. This formula is on your formula sheet. Uh, let's take a moment to flip over to the formula sheet and find it. Looking at your formula sheet, uh, we are in probability and distributions. Uh, specifically, we are down here, uh, discrete random variable x. Uh, there is your formula for both the mean and the standard deviation of a discrete random variable x. Uh, this, this chapter, we will also talk about the binomial and the geometric, but that's not until 6.3. So you can uh, you know, know we're coming back to those binomial and geometric things. Know that you don't know what that, those symbols mean, but we'll, you know, I'll teach you. It'd be great. Uh, looking at an example, just a, the simplest example we can have here, we're going to sell cars, we got the probability those cars are sold, we can calculate and interpret the mean and standard deviation of x. We're going to use these numbers over and over because it's a nice, simple example. You know, you're going to sell cars on a Friday morning, you're not going to sell that many. Let x equal number of cars sold to the first hour of business on a random selected Friday. Great. And uh, based on the previous records, so this is a uh, you might call this an empirical distribution. Um, it's, it's, there's no, there's no like grand underlying principle behind how many people show up at a car dealership to buy cars on a Friday. It's just you know random, random phenomenon. Who felt what way, whatever. Uh, so we have zero cars sold. 30, so what does this say? Thirty percent of the time on Friday morning we don't sell any cars. Forty percent of the time we sell one. Twenty percent of the time we sell two. 10% of the time we sell three. That's, that's all that that says. Um, we can calculate from that then uh, the mean and standard deviation of that random variable x. Let's do it pretty quick here. Should be a quick one. Uh, the mean of x is again, the sum of the values times the probabilities. I'll write up here, cars sold as the values. Probabilities, obviously. Uh, and so what's that gonna be? That's gonna be zero cars, 30% of the time, one car, 40% of the time, two cars, 20% of the time, and three cars, 10% of the time. Add that up, 0.3 times zero is zero, so that's 0 0.4, 0 0.4, and 0 0.3, I believe gives me 1.1. What does that mean? On average, or after many Fridays, The uh, number of cars sold is 1.1. Average. There's no day we sold 1.1 cars. But we add up all those days. We divide by how many days there were. Get 1.1. All right. So we can also then calculate the standard deviation. Uh, not bad here. This is like the one time we're going to calculate this by hand. Sigma of x equals, uh, I'm gonna show you the formula here, uh, square root of the sum of the values minus the mean squared times the probability it takes that value. Okay, I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna flip over to the key for this one because this one gets kind of tedious. All right, sharing the uh, completed notes with you. As a reminder, you've always got a completed notes um, PDF in the folder I give you. Uh, shows our mean calculation up above. Average number of cars sold each hour is 1.1. Uh, it's not each hour, that's the first hour of each day. On average, the number of call, cars sold is about 9.94 cars to the mean. Look what we've got here. The value of zero minus the mean of 1.1 squared times 0.3. Where did 0.3 come from? That's the probability it takes that value. And then we repeat. One minus 1.1, the mean, squared times 0.4 the probability. 2 minus 1.1 squared times 0.2, the probability. 3, yeah, you get it. Okay. Will you calculate these by hand that often? Uh, practically not. The standard deviation, it 
you will maybe once in a while. The mean is a more common calculation for you. So let's switch to something a little harder. AP example on the next page. I wonder if my face shows up twice here. AP example on the next page talking about ATMs. All right. Uh, so we have here some probabilities. We have probability distribution about ATMs. Um, A probably could have done. What's the problem? Actually, pause. Try and do it yourself. Take five minutes. Thanks for pausing. So what's the probability that at least one ATM is open? So you could have probability uh, X is greater than or equal to one. And you could add up these three. Or uh, maybe you, you see that at least one phrasing, and I could do one minus the probability that X is zero. That's just as quick. That's one minus 0. 0.15 is 0. 0.85. Great. Part B, what's the expected value? I can do that one uh, there in the small little space given. The expected value of X is the sum of the values times their probabilities. So what's that going to be here? It's going to be 0 times 0. 0.15, 1 times 0. 0.21, 2 times 0. 0.4, and 3 times 0. 0.24. Uh, you do that, what do we get there? 0, uh, 0. 0.21, uh, 1.01. Was that 1.73? I think it's 1.73. So something like on average, 1.73 ATMs are open, are working when the mall opens. You know, these ATMs, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And then part C, I like part C. Uh, what's the probability that all three ATMs are working given that at least one is working? Well, let's do C down here. Part C is asking probably that uh, X equals three, given that X is, uh, well, at least one. Well, that's gonna be the probability that X is three and X is at least one. How do I get that formula so quickly? That's the formula from chapter five. That's the conditional probability formula. We're gonna divide then by the probability that X is at least one. What's that gonna be? Well. It's equal to three 24% of the time. It's at least one 85% of the time. So we're saying of the 85 days, 85 of 100 days where at least one is working, 24 of those days, all three will be working. What's 24 divided by 85? I don't know. 0.28. So notice that probability is higher. If at least one is working, the probably at least three is working is going to be better. Given that at least one ATM is working when the mall is open, would the expected value uh, be less than, equal to, or greater than the expected value for part B and explain? I'm going to flip over to the key on this one because AP has got some wording I want you to see. Try and answer it yourself before, though. Say, we've taken out the possibility of zero. Zero is no longer a possibility. What's going to happen to the expected value? Gosh, take a moment. Try and expound on that yourself. All right, so you've, ta you've taken a look at this. Probably at least one working is 0.85. I found it using the complement. You can find it that way. Expected value uh, is 1.73. Look at my mental math on par. Uh, conditional probability formula on part C. Hopefully you could do that one. Take a moment to shore that one up. That's just that's the conditional probability formula you were given. And it's even they, they even forwarded the question in the conditional probability uh, sort of wording. Part D, I want you to emphasize. I want you to write down some more because I bet you kind of were lazy on it. No, not you. Never. Uh, given that it w at least one is working, the expected value of the number of ATMs would be greater. So very first thing, answer the dang question. Make sure you say that uh, the same greater than less than. Great. It's greater. Why? By eliminating the possibility of zero working ATMs, the probabilities of one, two, and three working ATMs, they got to go up because zero is not an option anymore. So the expected value must increase. Take a moment, pause, write some of that down, and think through it. Make sure you understand what we're talking about. If we take away the zero option, of course the expected value goes up. Next one, another AP example for you. Part A, straightforward as heck. 
calculate the expected value of x. You're going to find it, and then you're going to use that in part b to make a little comparison. And one of the big ideas, I'm going to switch over to the key in a moment. I'm not actually going to work this one. You're going to pause it and work through it. One of the keys on part b here is that well, something can happen in a short run, say 20 days. I'm going to say short run. And something could happen over a thousand days, and I might call that a longer run. How do you expect results after 20 days and results after a thousand days to compare? Which one is going to get closer to the truth? Something to consider there. Uh, part C is asking you to find a median by adding up columns until you get to 50%. And part D, if you know the relationship between the mean and the median, you should be able to say something about the shape of that distribution. That shape can also be seen if you converted uh, the probability distribution up above into a histogram. Take a moment, look at the key on the completed notes. Um, this one's a great review uh, from things this is from, what is this? This is chapter, chapter six, uh, kind of a chapter seven idea really, but also kind of a chapter two idea. Here's a chapter one idea. Here's a chapter one idea. There's stuff from all over here. Uh, last page, so you're going to have discrete random variables, and in those cases, the probability distribution is generally just going to be given to you because you can't calculate it on your own. Uh, in the case of continuous random variables, well, there's really only one continuous random variable we know how to work with. That is the normal, uh, the normally distributed random variable. So what do these have? They have, you know, infinite possible outcomes because they're anywhere between this and this, any value between here and here. Only interval outcomes, uh, we're going to use, well, you're going to use a CDF, specifically the norm CDF, to find the area of probability. Because everything we're going to deal with here is going to be under a normal curve. Because we don't really have the time, the technology, or the need to dive into other more complicated distributions. Right now, the normal distribution, our prototypical distribution, is, is enough. Uh, and here's some stuff for the calculus folks. If you are not calculus, you probably don't care about these next two pages or these next two little blocks here. For a continuous random variable, how is x less than a related to x less than or equal to a? They're equal. Probability x less than a is equal to the probability that x is less than or equal to a for the continuous case. And I might ask you calculus people why. Why is that true? You know, the infinitely thin slice has no, yeah, right. Uh, for the discrete case, how is probability x less than a? Probability x less than a is got to be less than or equal to the probability that x is less than or equal to a uh, in the case of the discrete. In the discrete, this might be like, you know, imagine if you had x less than 3. Well, that'd be 0, 1, and 2. But x less than or equal to 3, that'd be 0, 1, 2, and 3. This is the kind of inequality stuff I'm talking about that people will mistake. And I'll say, well, what, what happened? Silly mistake. Silly mistake. Last one. Uh, I don't even, I, you know, it's a normal probability problem. Define y, height of a randomly chosen young woman. Y, height of a young woman. Uh, and the probability, all right, y is distributed normally with a mean of 64, standard deviation 2.7. And it asks us, what's the probability height between 68 and 70? Probability y between 68 and 70. How are you going to solve that? You're going to solve that quickly with a norm CDF. Do it yourself. Let's look at the key. Quick way there would be norm CDF. Uh, again, though, I would need you to annotate those as lower, upper, uh, mean, and standard deviation. Forgetting those would be loss of points, uh, but a curve would be nice. A simple answer would be nice. Um, yeah, take a look at the, um, make sure you're, you're looking at these completed notes, especially for that uh, AP problem involving the telephone lines at the telephone bank. I worked through the rest of them for you. Um, make sure you keep caught up on this stuff. This is a Wednesday uh, assignment. Have it done before the next time I see you. Have a great day.